So tonight, or this morning, we're introducing Dr. Reverend Lawrence E. Berg. Man. He is a... Hmm? Bergman. Bergman. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I've known him for years. You would think I'd know that. Anyway, um, Reverend Larry has spoken on three continents from Brisbane, Australia to London, England. He's a well-known metaphysical teacher in our community. We're really grateful that he's here. Please join me in welcoming La Lawrence Bergman. <laughs> Thank you, John. It's always a pleasure to be invited back somewhere. It means I've not been excommunicated yet. <laughs> and with a little bit of luck, I will give you something to think about, to ponder upon, clear your mind. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. John 14:6. What a mouthful, and what does it mean, and what do we do with it? Does that mean Jesus is the gatekeeper? You can't get to heaven unless Jesus brings you in? How, we, how do we deal with this? If we look at this verse through the eyes of traditional Christianity, and I'm not sure what traditional Christianity really is anymore because it's such a mixture. Jesus is put on a pedestal to worship. Do you really think Jesus is meant to be worshipped? He was a human being just like we are. We have to differentiate between the Christ and Jesus. That was Christ John. I'm Christ Larry. And you're Christ Anne. You know, we are all Christ. We express the Christ consciousness in us, through us, from us. Worshippers have thought of Jesus and the saints as intercessors. We pray to them as intermediaries. And then they take our concerns to God. Do you really think this is true? Jesus told you to go directly to the Father. Go directly to God. We don't need intermediary. I don't know why they were thinking that for so many centuries. in Christianity. The new thought concepts and perspective are significantly different. We consider Jesus to be our elder brother and our way shower. Jesus showed us the way through his words and through his actions. We in new thought... See Jesus as an exception. No, no. Jesus is not the exception. He is the example of what we can be and what we can do as well. Not the exception. Do as I do, he said. Do it in my name. Or many places in the gospel says, do it in the name of Jesus. Jesus tells us in John 12, 14, 12, all the things I do, you can do, and greater. As a great master teacher, Jesus imparted his wisdom to his followers. As an example, and he approached with expectation and anticipation that his followers would do as they did and greater things. They would carry on tradition, the tradition and grow, grow beyond where he brought them to greater places. In that world of apprenticeships and where sons worked with their fathers and learned, not only did sons work with the fathers, but students worked with masters. And the hope and anticipation was that each would grow not only to be as good as the master, but to grow beyond. If you look at that system, I teach someone, and I hope that person will learn not only everything I have to teach them, but go beyond what I have to teach them to better things so they too can be teachers to other people down the road. This is how our society grows. 
This is how the world grows. This is how knowledge grows. If we think of where we are today and compare it with where we were 50 years ago, it's just incomprehensible. When I consider the concepts of the first century and the world of Jesus, to consider the meaning and the understanding in that period of time, I rely heavily on the works of Dr. Rocco Errico. And there was light and the Aramaic light on the Gospel of John. I pull heavily from. John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But what does it mean? It means what I teach is the path of truth and eternal life. Ah, truth and eternal life. I want that. It's universal. Everybody wants that. I don't care what your religion is. I don't care what your denomination within a religion is. I don't care if you have no religion at all. These are still what you want. It's universal truth. Jesus personified his teaching. He was a living example of truth, of action. He was the image of the living God here in the earth. An expression of consciousness of the way, the life, embracing our hearts, our souls, and our minds. Our hearts and our souls. Jesus demonstrated oneness. A oneness of loving presence of life, health, and goodness. All combination. Physical manifestation of our thinking process. This loving presence is everybody's source. Yours, mine, yours, everyone the source of all good and all joy, the source of life, which we call God. Jesus imparted this to his disciples, his followers, and to us indirectly. To rely, to really understand God the Father, one would have to come to the Son. It is the Son who reveals the Father. In the Near East, there exists a special relationship between the Father and the Son. The Father will reveal everything he knows to the Son. Nothing will be held back. No secret will be kept from the Son. The Son knows everything. Thus, if one wishes to know more about the Father and his secrets, where do you go? You go to the Son. Jesus revealed the truth, the loving nature of God, because he knew him as a father, his beloved. Not as God. But you realize the term father in Aramaic also means beloved. So Jesus was one with his beloved, one with his father, one with God. For the Christ that is, the spirit of truth and life, existed with God from the beginning. It is through the Christ that one can see God. The works of Jesus were the works of God. His healing, his healing power, was the power of God. The realization is that God manifested and worked through Jesus. God manifested and worked through Jesus. Those who saw him, that is Jesus, saw the Father at work. Thus, one comes to the Son to see the Father at work. An interesting concept. Probably not one that we have embraced in the past. Jesus exhibited the way in his teachings and his actions. The early disciples were called the followers of the way. Christianity was never meant to be 
just another religion, but a way of life, both a journey and a path to be walked and a life to be lived. How many people do you know that go to church one hour for Sunday and that's it? And what they are on Sunday is not what they are on Monday or Wednesday or Friday. This is a way of life. I am who I am because of my beliefs and my thoughts. I need to express these day after day after day in all that I think, all that I do, and all that I say. You are not one person on Sunday and someone else the rest of the week. I hope. The disciples were learning how to be at one with Jesus, just as Jesus was at one with the Father. In the Gospels, there are many references to Jesus saying, in my name, or in the name of Jesus. So we might ask, what does this really mean? <clears throat> does the name Jesus have some mystical content to it? Is it a magic word? Like, open sesame. If that were true, then all the people with the same name as Jesus would have had the same powers that Jesus had. But we don't read about them. So maybe that's not quite the situation. The name Jesus was a very popular name in Jesus' time and before and after. And in some cultures, it even is today may not be pronounced Jesus, but it looks like it when you see the spelling. Why don't they all have the magic power that Jesus had? In Aramaic, Jesus would have been called Yeshua. And it meant <clears throat> Yahweh saves or helps. What did he say? Green stamps? <clears throat> How about he saves your soul? He gives you the opportunity to grow in oneness with the Father. If we look at how these terms are used in the Gospels, it is clear that the meaning is in my way, or the method that I used, or the system of doing things, the consciousness, the understanding, the loving presence known as God, God is in me. I am in God. I express God in what I think, say, and do. So if I'm going to be at one with God and do the things that Jesus did because Jesus said all the things I do, you can do greater, then I must be at one with God as well. My heart, my soul, and my mind. If we look at Einstein's splitting of the atom, which you're all aware of, it would be rather foolish if I would say, Adam, in the name of Albert Einstein, split. I mean, come on now. You didn't even laugh. You know how stupid that would be. Now, would it be similar when I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, heal to a sick person. And you'd get the same results. What? Nothing happened. Clearly, if we were going to split an atom in the name of Albert Einstein, we would need to go into the laboratory and do exactly what Albert Einstein did to split the atom. He had a method. He had a procedure. It was scientifically worked out. Similarly, we need to approach matters where we might invoke Jesus' name in the same way that Jesus approached these issues using the method that Jesus used, using the way that Jesus used. What did Jesus do? Our hearts, our minds, our souls 
must be at oneness with God's loving presence, the source of all good. If God can do anything, and we know that's true, you can do it too. But how? You have to be at one with God, at one with the Christ consciousness which existed from everlasting to everlasting. You are created in the image and likeness of God. Each and every one of us is created in the image and likeness of God. Well, then why don't you look like you, look like you, look like me? We all look different. Something's haywire. We recall from Genesis 1 that we are created in the image and likeness of God. But maybe, just maybe, it's not through our physical being that we're created in the image and likeness of God, but in our mind and in our soul and our spirit. Mentally and spiritually. I like the analogy that a glass of ocean water is to the ocean as each of us is to God. You can hold that glass. You can taste the water. You know it tastes like the ocean. You may not see a sea monster in it, but you know the essence of the ocean water is like the rest of the ocean. I am of God. I belong to the same sea of spirituality as God does. Maybe we're the same essence, but just different in magnitude. That's all the difference between a glass of ocean water and the whole ocean. The difference between each of us and God. Magnitude. But the same essence. Express that essence in your life. You be the God here in the earth plane. Each of you. I'd like to share some insights from Imelda Shanklin's book, What Are You? What are you? What are you? You are a soul that has forgotten it's divine identity. Spiritually, you are an idea in the mind of God. Thoughts based on recognition of your true identity will reconstruct your body in a way to make you physically fit. You must consciously construct with the mind of God and you must stay connected that your body may be fed with God's perfect life. God's perfect life comes through your mind expressed in your body. Physically, you are the substance of God, molded in the matrix of your mind. Your mind affects your body. That is an amazing thing. Your mind affects your body. You do the creating. You are the creator. Your body is the blossom of your mind. When you choose your thoughts, you choose the results. Everything originates in your mind. You are what you think. Oh, that's, that's not what some of you want to hear. You are what you think. I think I'm sick. I think I'm sick. I think, think I'm sick. God, I don't know where. Yikes. No wonder you're sick. No. No, 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 no. I am a happy, healthy, radiant child of God, and I want you all to say that. I am a happy, healthy, radiant child of God, and so it is. Amen. I express God in my world. You express God in your world. If you want to express God, you must connect to God with your consciousness, with your subconsciousness. You are the Spirit of God here in the earth plane. And it must be expressed in all you think, all you say, and all that you do. We are a way of life. And hopefully we are God's way of life.
You are what you think. Being a child of God, you can create as God created and as God creates. It's not over yet. The mind is the image and likeness of God that we were created in. Mind is the master builder. Mind is the most powerful force in the universe. In praying to God, we ask. Do we ask for things? Oops. If we ask for things, we expect God is a vending machine in the sky. I do not believe that God is a vending machine in the sky. Therefore, I don't ask for things. Things are a byproduct of my world. Okay, if I don't ask for things, what do I ask for? How about I ask for blessings? I ask for divine ideas. Oh, divine ideas. What a magical. If I look out there at all the divine ideas that are available to me, I pick some that I'd like to express and deal with and grasp them to me so they can grow in me and be expressed in my life. I pray. I pray for blessings and divine ideas. Because if I can take a divine idea and let it grow in my subconscious and my superconscious, it will manifest in my life. Manifestation is the creation of where we are, of all that we have in our lives. If you don't like your life, change your thinking. Jesus' way, as our way should also be, was the way of forgiveness, inclusiveness, and loving kindness. When Jesus asked for something, he always gave thanks in advance, before the manifestation. Jesus did not hope for a result to manifest. He knew the result would manifest. He could see it already manifested in his mind. Now, when you were children, you probably had read you the little engine that could, where the engine was going up the hill. And it wasn't sure that it could make over the top. And said, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. And when it got over the top and started down the other side, it said, I knew I could, I knew I could, I knew I could. This is what we do in our lives. We have these ideas. We are hoping. We are building. We make them manifest. And we hope. I know I can. Nah, not I hope. No, nope. I know. I know I can. I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. I know I can. And then when we've got it, say, look, I did it. I knew I could do that. I knew I could. This is the power of imagination. Imagination. Imagination is to image in the mind. You image in a manifestation that you want to occur. You envision it. Imagination is one of our 12 powers. But so is faith. And Jesus had faith that what he envisioned would manifest. This is an act of creation where you envision an idea into completion. Take those divine ideas, create in your mind, conceive it, believe it, and achieve it. One is not sufficient. You've got to do all three. Because unless you really wholeheartedly believe in what you're doing, you're not going to achieve it. You conceive it. You believe it. That allows you to conceive it.
This is an, an example of thoughts held in mind produce after their kind. Okay, everybody? Thoughts held in mind produce after their kind. Our mind is the most powerful force in the universe. But you can't just dream it. You must conceive it, believe in it, and then achieve it. And it will happen. Now let's just take a minute. Close our eyes. I let my mind go within deeply and deeper. My mind goes so deep within that I'm out there somewhere in the universe. And it's out there in the universe that we become one. Not only do we become one with each other, but we become one with the Christ consciousness, one with God, one with universalness, where all the ideas of the world are sprinkled before me like stars in the heavens. And I look at them twinkling and say, is this yours? They say to me, yours? Which is yours? Pick one. Pick several. Pick some. So I see the divine ideas, and all of a sudden something says, ooh, this is an interesting idea. Let me grasp it and then clasp it to me to take internally. Just like a seed that I plant in the ground. I need to give it time to grow. An incubation time before it pops through the soil. And all of a sudden, when it pops through the soil, oh, I see it. I see it grow. I want to see it blossom and bloom and seed start over. Because each seed will generate a new generation. The seeds in my mind are planted and they grow. They blossom in me because I Conceive, believe, and achieve. Because God said I can. This is how my life works. And I can grow with that. And I say, thank you, Lord. Amen. And I come back into my normal consciousness, but you are now in the beta state of consciousness where your mind is working at 12 cycles per second and greater. But whenever we want to grasp things to us and let them grow in our subconscious, we go down to alpha, which we just did in that little brief time. Because when you take a deep breath and you relax and you slow your body down, you are then in alpha, which is 8 to 12 cycles per second. That is where your mind in your subconscious. That is where we go every night in meditation. Every morning in meditation. And when you're at a meeting and things are not going well, you say, okay, folks, let's take a minute out. And you instruct them as the leader to take a deep breath and relax. Because when you take that deep breath to relax, you are dissolving the tensions of the room and you give it that full minute, 90 seconds maybe, so that when you come back, you can smile, and they will smile back at you. Say, okay, did you get any divine idea? Oh, I can't say that. It's a meeting. It was not a, group, a church meeting. I can't say, did you have your divine idea? You can say, did you settle something in your mind so we can now get back to business and resolve the tensions here? Thank you very much. And we say, thank you for all these thoughts. I will embrace them to my soul manifest them in my life, my thoughts, my words, my deeds, and I say, thank you, Lord. Amen.